waiting on us. <laughs> Why don't you stand with us this morning? Let's begin as we sing the Father's house. Amen. 
people said. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. It is great to see you. Uh, I, I, we say this often. I don't care if this is your home or if it's your first time visiting with us. I hope you feel at home. We're just a bunch of regular people that love the Lord and gather together on His day to worship. This morning, I want to share a passage of Scripture. Uh, you're going to hear more about this this morning, but we have a, a, a gentleman that's been pastoring our area for a very, very long time as our guest with us this morning, Brother Ricky Cunningham from over at Hardin. Uh, I guess I was thinking a little bit about my pastor who pastored this area for a long time, and it's why I thought of something. I'm, I'm going to read a passage from Ephesians chapter 1. And it's one of these fuzzy memories I remember when I was pretty young of my pastor when he was preaching through Ephesians. And he said, when you're, when you're looking at some of these texts, you got to pay attention to the prepositions because they're the thing that really brings out some of the power where it talks about by faith through Christ. Think about that, how, how important those words are in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth this morning you may be in here and you have no idea why you even came this morning you came with a friend you came an invitation I pray that each of us are on divine appointment this morning for one thing or another but this morning can I encourage you to recall the great links and the great price that was paid for your redemption not just mankind, not just, but for you, for me. We're going to share a song that we know pretty well here at First Baptist now. Enjoy it, listen to it, but be prompted to recall the goodness of God and the price of redemption.
Don't you get shout me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shout me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. scares every Baptist in here. Just take a moment. Just settle our hearts and minds in worship. Can you just pause and pray on your own? Just think about what you're grateful for. Just think about the cross. Think about the beauty of the gospel that you have been saved from. through. Just take a moment. Settle your hearts and minds as we continue in worship. Father, we love you. God, we have so much to be grateful for. And our words can express that kind of gratitude. And when we think, truly grasp the gospel and just that amount of love that you would send Christ to die for us, that you would take our place on the cross, when we truly begin to wrap our minds around that, we just see how unworthy of the gospel we are, but yet you still love us to die for us. What a beautiful and glorious truth. God, as we continue in worship this morning, I pray that our hearts are fixated on you, that we're laying everything that happened this week. We're not anticipating the week ahead. We're not thinking about what's gone on this past few days, but we are completely and totally focused on you. God, we pray this. This might be so. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to First Baptist. Thank you for being here again this morning. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our children for children's worship, kindergarten through fourth grade. It's hard to follow up a worship set like that. I'm just going to tell you. Chad Badger looked at me and said, follow that up. Good luck. (laughs) And it's true. It's true. But if you are a guest, welcome to First Baptist. We're glad you're here. If you were part of our faith family, we're glad you're here too. Thank you for being with us, worshiping with us this morning. Uh, Very brief in view of announcements this morning, we're gearing up for summer activities. Uh, Youth camp, we can go ahead and sign up for that. Parents, sign up your student for youth camp. June 7th through 11th, you don't have to take care of them. We do that. Like, Get them out of the house for a week. It's a wonderful week at crossings. They're worshiping the Lord. They're growing in their faith. Or if they don't know the Lord, that that is a wonderful time where they're just laying all distractions aside and focusing on the Lord. It is a wonderful week. Sign-ups are open. You can use the code on that screen. We would ask that you get your deposit in by February 28th. It's a $75 deposit. You can just use uh, text to give. Text to FBC Mayfield to 73256. There's a drop-down that says Youth Camp. You can do that. You can pay by check. 
uh, whatever is most convenient for you. And then we also have the women's retreat. And when we think of a retreat, we think we're leaving something. We're running from something. Ladies, you get to leave your husbands if you're married for a few days. You get to retreat from them. All responsibilities. Children, they got it. They can do it. Go to this. That's all I really have to say about that. Did I just quote Forrest Gump in a service? I'm just kidding. But women's retreat. Use the code on your bulletin there. You can sign, that, uh, sign up through that QR code. You can go to fbcmayfield.com. Scroll down. You'll see the sign up there. Con- contact the church office. But that is September 20th through 22nd in Branson, Mag- Branson Missouri. It's going to be a great week. We hope you join Jan and the ladies for that. I think they've done something similar uh, last year in Gatlinburg, and it was an awesome time from what I hear. I was not invited, but the, I hear that it was great. I think you will love that, so go ahead and get signed up for that. In way of introduction, we have Brother Ricky Cunningham with us today. We are grateful that you are here with us, Brother. Ricky was born and raised in Callaway County. He's a senior pastor at Hardin Baptist Church, where he has served in that position since 1983. Brother Ricky is a graduate from Mid-Continent University. He is also the instructor at the Riverbank Bible Institute in Brazil, where he teaches and trains pastors along the Amazon River Valley region. Uh, We can relate to that and training pastors overseas. That's a ministry close to our heart here as well. Uh, He's married to his wife, Salisa. They have two children, Kiki and Corey, and four wonderful grandchildren, Crowder Wayne, Finley Knox, Garnet Levi, and Evie Kate. Uh, First Baptist friends, will you welcome Brother Ricky Cunningham? Wow, what a blessing for me, a kid from Dexter, Kentucky, to be in First Baptist Church, Mayfield, Kentucky this morning. What a blessing. Never thought I would get this honor as a kid growing up. I loved it when my papa would take me to this store in Mayfield, Kentucky called Falders. You ever been to Falders? Wow, I love that store. And then as I got older and God called me to preach, I got to be educated biblically at Mid-Continent Baptist Bible College. So I just love the Graves County area. Thank you so much much for giving me the honor of being a First Baptist Church. Now, I've got to be honest, uh, being a kid from Dexter and uh, pastoring in a small town called Hardin, I've always heard you First Baptist churches were kind of stuffy, and you were kind of a, wow, didn't find that at all. Love you so much. Thank you for the way you've welcomed me this morning. Thank you for the way you worship the Lord through song. That was amazing. I told Brother Paul I will need to know what the last song is because normally on the fourth song, I kind of think about what I'm supposed to say and get ready for the message. But wow, when that song came up, I I couldn't think about the message. I had to continue to worship with you. So thank you so much for the honor. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and be opening this morning. Hope it doesn't offend anybody. I read out of an English Standard Version of the Bible. But we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12 in just a few minutes moments, but let me remind you that Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 12 is in the second part of Paul's letter. I love the Apostle Paul. I I love how normally in the first part of his letters, he just tells us and talks extensively about what God has done for us in Christ. And then in the second part of his letter, in the practical application part, he always comes back down to the earth firmly planted on the earth, telling us now what we ought to be doing for God since we are in Christ. Everybody get that? Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, it doesn't open like getting on an airplane and going down a runway and rising after several minutes to about 30,000 feet. No. (laughs) Ephesians blast off like a rocket. Did you hear what your worship pastor read this morning? Ephesians chapter 1. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And then he talks about the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he tells us that the same power with which he reached down and raised Jesus from the dead, he reached down and raised us to a new life in Christ. We were dead in sin, but now we are alive with Christ and we're seated with him at the right hand throne of God. Amen? And we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. We are his work of art, so to speak. And then he tells us this. He's taking us, Jews and Gentiles, and forming a new body. 
by his death on the cross. He broke down that middle wall of partition that was in the temple that separated from Jews and Gentiles. And now he's bringing both of us together to form a new body, the church. And guess who the church is? The habitation for the Holy Spirit of God. And then Ephesians chapter 3, before he's going to come crashing back into the earth, he reminds us that what he just told us about the church and the Holy Spirit dwelling us as the church Old Testament saints did not know this. Not even the prophets were told this, but it was revealed to Paul and the apostles. And so he's letting us in on this big secret. Now he comes crashing back down to earth in Ephesians chapter 4, and here's what he's going to do. With his his feet firmly planted on the earth, he's going to start telling us what we now should be doing for God since we're in Christ. Now, I know I've said that twice. But I want to make sure you understand this. You do not do for God so God will do for you. You do for God because he's already done for you. And here's what he says. I urge you as a prisoner of the Lord to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now this calling that he's talking about is this. Each one of us who are in this church... Each person that he's writing to at the church of Ephesus, we've been called to be a member of the body of Christ. You in particular here at First Baptist Church may feel. Now, when he says for us to walk worthy, this word walk literally is referring to our lifestyle. It's the word that means to walk around. It refers to the lifestyle you live. And here's what he's saying. Our lifestyle ought to be worthy of something. We are to be worthy of being a member of the body of Christ. But I love this word worthy because it's a, it's, a, it's a word picture. It's the picture of weighing something on a scale. Now, I don't know about you guys, but every morning when I get up and I go run, I come back and I weigh after I run because that's going to be my lightest weight of the day. And at my age, I want to be light. So I jump up on this electronic scale, and all of a sudden it tells me how much I weigh. Now, in the ancient world, they didn't have scales like that. You've seen it. They, they had this scale that had a platform on this side and a platform on this side and had a needle. And if you were going to weigh something, you would put your standard of weight on this side and then you would put what you were weighing on this side and then you knew this side weighed this side the same when it balanced the scales. Now get this picture. That's the picture. Paul has told us what God has done for us in Christ. Now he's going to start talking about being a member of the church. And here's what he wants each one of you to do, to weigh yourself. And see if your weight as a member of the church at First Baptist Church Mayfield weighs as much as God wants you to weigh. To balance the scale, so to speak. Now I've got a memory in my mind of being a kid. I was raised on the farm. And I would see my papa and I would see my dad doing things and I would try to do what they were doing. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be a farmer. And I have this picture in my mind of us working in the shop. And while we're working in the shop, I would watch my dad and my papa get ready to take duels off a tractor and they would put this wrench on a nut and then they would take all of their force and try to break the nut loose and they couldn't and then they would take a big old breaker bar you know about six eight ten foot long and they would put that over that wrench and when they would put that over that wrench if they couldn't take their weight and pull it down you know what my dad would do my dad would climb up on the top of the tractor tire and then he'd put his weight on that and when he did it'd break it loose I'll never forget this one day I saw it coming it was my opportunity my papa put that socket on that nut And then they slid that long breaker bar over that. And before my dad could jump up there, I jumped up there. And I'm on top of this tire. And all of a sudden, when they have it just right, I start taking all of my weight. I don't know, I weigh about 45, 50 pounds at this time. And I'm jumping up and down on that bar. And all that bar would do was this. And I'm jumping up and down and up and down, up and down. And it never broke loose. And I got down, and I'll never forget these words as long as I have. My papa looked at me and said this. Ricky, you don't have enough lead in your britches. <laughs> now, I'm a little bitty feller. 
I really wanted to help my papa and my dad. So you know what I did? While they were bricking that loose, I went out in the shop and I got every piece of metal I could and I filled my britches. I even put some in my socks because I knew I didn't have enough lead in my britches. As we get ready to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, I want you to ask this question. As a member of this church, do you believe God believes you have enough lead in your bridges? Do you weigh spiritually what you should weigh so this church can be who God wants it to be in this community? This morning, we're going to talk about the DNA of a biblical church. Would you stand with me now and let's read God's word from Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 through 12. We stand in honor of the reading of God's word. This is God to us. We pay attention when someone's talking to God. You ever notice we catch someone praying we just stop? If you're at a restaurant and you're saying the blessing, the waitress comes up, they'll stop. Because you're talking to God. This is God talking to us. ESB says this, verse 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Father, wow. I've already thanked you even on my drive here, but thank you again for this honor of being able to teach, to speak to these awesome people who are your church. I know many of them personally, but I know most of them by reputation. What an awesome light this church is to this community. But Father, we want to continue to be who you want us to be. So that you can use us in this community for your honor and your glory. I ask now that you give me the ability to say what I need to say in the time allotted. But don't let Satan snatch this away from anyone. Let us hunger to know what you teach us in this passage. And it's in your precious son's name we ask now for you not to let us be hearers of the word only. But we want to be doers and I don't want to be a speaker only. I want to be a doer of your word too. In your precious, precious son's name we pray now. Amen. You may be seated. I attended a Bible college when I, a Bible conference in Paducah, Kentucky when I first came to Harden. And the man who taught, his name was Ron Dunn. He was teaching on Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. And I got to be honest with you, 40-something years later, I have no idea what he spoke about. Could not tell you a thing he taught in his sermon from Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. But he made a statement, and I've never forgotten it. This statement has become part of the DNA of Hardin Baptist Church in Hardin, Kentucky. Not because I originated this statement, because I heard it and remembered it. And here was the statement. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, we are a city church in Hardin. We got a city population of 387, I believe. Had a shooting the other day. The person did not die, so the population is still the same. But over the years, we have some folks who don't live in the city. They live in the country, and I don't know if you've noticed this, you city folks, but those people who live out in the country, they speak different than those of us who live in the city. So we've had to modify the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing because out in the country they say it different. They say the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So at Harden we no longer say the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. We now say this. The main thing thing is to keep the main thing thing the main thing thing. Now I don't know if you're a city church, country church, or if there's folks from all over Graves County and surrounding areas who come to First Baptist Church But please hear me. As we approach this subject, I want you to keep this in mind. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So many churches today are distracted with things that do not matter. And we get all bent out of shape over it. 
Because of what our great-great-granddaddy believed and our granddaddy believed and our uncle believed. And, the, and it has nothing to do with the Bible. It's what we prefer. But I want to remind every member of this church, this is not your church. This is Christ's church. And he is the one we should be striving to please. Amen? So therefore, I just want you to say this with me. The main thing thing is to keep the main thing thing, the main thing thing. Would you say it with me? The main thing thing is to keep the main thing thing, the main thing. Now, what does Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 tell us? That he, Christ, gave gifts to his church. He gave the gift of an apostle. He gave the gift of the prophet. He gave the gift of the evangelist. And he gave the gift of the shepherd teacher. Now, I was educated at Mid-Continent Baptist College. I am so thankful for that. I had a man by the name of Mike Morse who taught me Greek, and I am so thankful that he gave me the tools to study God's Word. If you'll notice when we read this in our Bibles, it says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, but it doesn't say and the teachers. There's no the in front of teachers. Because this is not talking about five gifts to the church. It's talking about four gifts to the church. And the fourth gift is the pastor, the shepherd, who teaches. Does that make sense? So here's what I want us to believe as a church. If we're going to have the DNA of a biblical church, here's what we've got to believe. Our pastors who teach, they are gifts from God. Have any of you ever received a gift? Normally, if you receive a gift from somebody you know, they give you something they think you need. Not just what they think you want. They give you what they think you need. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody gives me a gift and I open it up, I go, wow. This is a gift. They're trying to show me how much they love me. Now, I want to be honest with you. I've been given some gifts that I wouldn't have personally ever bought. But when I get that gift from someone and expresses their love for me and expresses what they feel like I need or want, I, I thank them. I speak highly of them. I don't ever remember being a kid growing up getting a gift and Turn into somebody saying, can you believe what they just gave me? That's the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. There is no way in the world I'm going to wear that shirt. I mean, did any of you do that when you received a gift? I mean, go down to the coffee shop. Go down to Falders. Go into a restaurant and still be talking about can't believe. That's the gift I got. We just don't do that. Now, here's what I want to suggest to us. I believe this passage is teaching that we need to look at our leaders, those pastors who teach us as gifts from God. And when we're out in this community, our words need to express that, wow, these people are gifts from God. Amen? You know this. You interact with other Christians from other churches. You know that's not always the way people talk about their leaders. They publicly criticize. They publicly condemn. They pub No. If we're going to have the lead in our spiritual britches that God wants us to have as Brother Paul gets ready to come back to be the shepherd teacher. Please view him as a gift from God. 
And for your other pastors here who teach, please view them as gifts from God. God knows what you need, even though sometimes it may not be what we think we want. Amen? Now, why does God give pastor teachers to churches? To equip the saints. Now, I grew up, I love this version of the Bible. King James Version of the Bible. I do not read King James Version of the Bible anymore, but I want you all to know I love that translation. It was a great translation in 1611. But there was one mistake made that was catastrophic for Baptist churches. In the King James Version of the Bible, they put a period here, I mean, a comma after that God gave pastor shepherds to equip the saints, comma, to do the work of ministry, comma, to edify the body, comma. And it caused most of us Baptist churches to believe that we're paying a pastor to do three things. Equip the saints, do the work of ministry, and grow the church. And what happened in a lot of Baptist churches, not this church, but a lot of churches, church became a spectator sport. We pay a pastor. He's supposed to equip the saints. He's supposed to do the work of ministry. He's supposed to grow the church. And we encourage him. We cheer him on. We pay a salary. We, no. No. When Brother Paul assumes the pastor to this church, he does not have three responsibilities in this passage. He has one. And I want you to pray that he keeps the main thing, thing, the main thing, thing. And that is when he comes here as a gift from God to you, he's going to quip the saints. I love this. Now, I'm transparent. I was not reared in a church who taught about sainthood. As a matter of fact, in our church, I was taught growing up as a kid that we're all just sinners saved by grace. And my granddaddy Bogard would hit the floor on that Sunday night. We'd have testimony service, and his first testimony would be, his first sentence would be, now I know y'all know me, and y'all know I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And then I got to trying to find that phrase in the Bible and couldn't find it anywhere. Have y'all found it anywhere? Paul never writes to the saved sinners at Corinth, save sinners at Rome, save sinners at Ephesus, save sinners at Philippi. He always writes to who? The saints. Now, in the little church I was raised in, there was only one lady that we called a saint in the church, and her name was Evie. And she lived on the way to the church. And when we would drive to church, about half a mile before we get to church, there would be St. Abby out on the front porch, and she'd just be rocking back and forth. And my mom and dad would say, y'all say hi and wave to St. Abby. And we'd roll the window down, and we'd say, hi, St. Abby, Evie. And then when service is over, we'd be going back. She'd still be in the rocker rocking. We'd be on the other side of the car now. And we're going back. And we'd have to wave bye to St. Evie. Now, all I've heard growing up in my church is we're all sinners saved by saint. But that was the only, or saved, sinners saved by grace. But that was the only saint I heard called a saint. And I just had this theory growing up. Well, I know why she's a saint. She's so old, she couldn't sin if she wanted to. Amen. She had no opportunity to see. She never got off that front porch rocker. And that was the image I had as a kid growing up in the church. And here's what a lot of us believe. A lot of us believe we're just sinners saved by grace. No. If you're still a sinner, you need to be saved by grace. Hear me say this. If your lifestyle is you are a sinner and you want to sin... And you don't want to do what God wants you to do. Yes, you need to be saved by grace. But the moment a sinner is saved by grace, God does not leave him a sinner. He does not leave him dead in sin. He does not leave him under the power of sin. He changes him into a person who's alive with Christ. And you receive a new nature. You used to be dead to God and alive to sin. But now you are dead to sin and alive to God. And you're God's work of art. Amen? Wow. So if you're a member of this church, I want you to believe this. You are a saint of God. And the reason you're going to have a pastor is because of you. The saints. That word saint literally means holy one. Yeah, we struggle being called a saint. We really struggle being a holy one. 
But that's who we are. Holy means we've been separated. We've been cut. We've been separated from a life of sin to a life of salvation in Christ. It does not mean we don't ever sin. Saints still sin, but it's not our nature to sin. Am I not right? When you sin, doesn't it bother you? Why does it bother you? Because you're not a sinner anymore. If you were still a sinner, it wouldn't bother you to sin. But because you're a saint and you've got a new nature, it bothers you. Saints still sin, but here's what saints don't do. We do not live a lifestyle of sin anymore. Amen? And so the pastor is coming. The pastoral staff here that's already are here because of you. And they're here to equip you, the saints. I love this word, equip. It had three primary uses in the biblical world. It was used to talk about a fisherman getting his net ready to fish with. It was also used to talk about the military leaders getting the army ready for battle. But then it was also used to talk about getting a ship ready to sail. Now, I like this third metaphor best. So I'm going to use it here if you don't mind. I spent three weeks in Brazil. Been going to Brazil since 1996. It's just a blessing to teach pastors and church leaders on the bank of the Amazon River. And I'll tell you what one of my favorite things to do is. One of my favorite things to do is when my day's over and the teaching's done, I like to go sit down on the river. Have any of you seen the Amazon River in person? Wow. Now, I just, I don't mean no disrespect here, but you know that river we've got over yonder just a few miles from us that we call the mighty Mississippi? Once you've been on the Amazon, that thing looks like a creek. No disrespect. The Amazon River in places is seven, eight miles wide. When it starts getting to the Atlantic Ocean, it's almost 100 miles wide. This river is amazing. And so I'm sitting on the bank eating my pond cashew and drinking my maracuja, juice maracuja. And all of a sudden, I'll see this big ship. Going down the river. And sometimes that ship stops right there in Paranchines. And they start putting people on these little boats. And they start coming into Paranchines. And they start invading the city. They start going into shops. They start going into restaurants. And then I realize real quick, that's a cruise ship. And there's some mighty cruise ships. And I've never been on a cruise. People tell me I need to go on a cruise. Never been on a cruise. But here's what I understand about cruises. You pay your money and it's all about you. Have you ever seen the crew of a cruise ship? If there are 3,000 people on a cruise ship, they will advertise 1,500 people on the crew. You know why they have so many crew on a cruise ship? Because a cruise ship is all about you, the one taking the cruise. It's all about you. And I see those big cruise ships out on the river. But that's not my favorite ship. The Amazon River is so big, ocean-going vessels from Southeast Asia, Japan, China, come down that river. And I'll see a boat bigger than a cruise ship, and it's loaded with cargo. And that's the majority of the boats on that river. Now, there's a drastic difference between a cargo ship and a cruise ship. See, on a cargo ship, they don't have many crew people. They got mainly cargo. And everybody that's on that cargo ship is there because of the cargo. Does that make sense? Now, let me ask this question. How does First Baptist Church Mayfield view the church? How do you view your membership? this church all about you? Is that your first thought? Or do you believe we're here because of the cargo? And the cargo is not us. The cargo is the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you, First Baptist Church Mayfield, please do not make membership about you. Please don't make the ministries of this church about us only. But let's see ourselves as God sees us. 
He has given us the gospel. He's given us the good news of his son, Jesus Christ. And there are ports of people that he wants us to deliver this good news to. Yes. The pastor's here to what? Get us ready as a church to do what God's called us to do. And what's he called us to do? And that's to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. And you know where it starts? It starts at Falder. Starts in the restaurant you eat in. You, you know that little pocket store that you, yeah, I stop there sometimes. I'm not just going in there to get a Twinkie or a Snicker after I fill up my truck. I'm meeting people. You're meeting people. Our church services should remind us. Of who we are. We're a cargo ship. Amen. So when you see your pastors. Just remind them. Hey I'm glad you're here. Because you're supposed to be getting me ready to do what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's I'm part of the crew of this church. Amen. Amen. Now watch this. What are we equipping the saints to do? To do the work of ministry. It's not the pastoral staff. It's not Brother Paul when he gets here that will do the work of ministry. It's the saints. Now, I think God's pretty smart. Most churches have few pastors, but they got a lot of saints. So doesn't it make sense the saints are doing the work of the ministry and not the pastors? We do not want to let the church become a spectator sport. So here's what pastors do. They get us who are saints ready to do the work of the ministry. So if a pastor keeps the main thing, the main thing, in every teaching, every opportunity that he's before you, he's going to be thinking about how does this message that I'm teaching from God's word equip us to be who we're supposed to be, and in particular the saints. And here's what our responsibility is. We're doing the work of ministry. Now, I think you guys have deacons in this church. Is that right? Most Baptist churches do. If you're a deacon in this church, ordained deacon, can I just see you raise your hand? Wow, we got several. Praise the Lord. I love the deacons in my church. Uh, every deacon's meeting we have, when we have a deacon's meeting, I affectionately call them the dirty-footed ones. And then you know how they answer me back? Oh, beautiful-footed one. See, the Bible teaches that he who preaches the good news of the gospel, he's got beautiful feet. Amen. So if I were to take my shoes off, I would have beautiful feet. Amen? But the word for deacon comes from a word that literally means to have dirty feet. Because you know what's at the root of the word deacon? It's the word servant. And in the biblical world, if you were a servant, you did not have shoes. If you were a son, you had shoes. But if you were a servant in the household, you did not have shoes, which meant in serving, if it was dry season, your feet were always dusty. If it was rainy season, your feet would be muddy. So when you looked down at a servant, you looked at their feet and called them the dirty-footed one. That's what the word literally means, dirty-footed one. I'm glad you have men in this church who have been assigned the responsibility of taking care of the physical needs of church members. But I want us to watch this. This is the word that Paul uses to talk about the ministry we all have. Wow. So I I want you to get this picture. You know, when you go into that restaurant, there is usually a way you can tell who's going to wait on you because they've got this little thing around their waist. They've got this little book and a little pen. But that's not the picture I want you to see. I want you to see my granny. I want you to see my mama. I want you to see my wife. My grandkids call her Mimish. She gets ready to serve us a big meal, and she puts this thing on called an apron. And everything she's working with, sooner or later, part of that will be on that apron. Do y'all remember your granny's apron, your mama's apron? Didn't you love it when she put that on? Because that meant, wow, this is going to get really, really good. Here's the picture you need to have. What ministry in this church do you have that reveals to the church and this community that you're here to serve? 
You roll up your britches legs. You roll up your sleeves. And you get dirty. Not just on Sunday morning in a nursery. That's a great ministry. But where are we getting dirty with lost people in this community during the week where we're serving them? And I'm saying to my pastor, I'm ready to do what God's called me to do. I've got this place, but I need you to help me. I need you to equip me. I need you to get me ready. Isn't God brilliant? Instead of wanting one guy doing the work of ministry, he wants all the saints doing the work of ministry. God impressed upon me this early when I came to Harden. Because I was raised in one of those churches under the King James Version of the Bible where my granddad of Ogre thought the pastor did all three things and the rest of us watched. And then I began to learn how to study God's Word and realize, oh, that's not true. And then one day I went fishing. I'm not a fisherman. One day I went fishing with one of my guys from church. Some of you know that guy. His name is James Mathis. He worked here in Mayfield at General Tire for years. He loved to take me fishing, and we were out fishing in his boat. And James is deceased, but I can still tell this truthfully about him, not talking about him, love him with all my heart. He'd take me fishing, and he had his boat rigged up with these crappie poles. And, man, he'd always catch fish. I wouldn't hardly catch fish. But he had his little foot on that little thing. And then I realized later he had places marked, and he would keep his boat over those rigs and I'm in the back of the boat I'm not over those rigs now, now, now get this picture we're, we're coming in one day and we've caught a few crappie and we're coming in and I'm coming across Kentucky Lake with him I'm in his boat and all of a sudden I see this guy out in the middle of the lake and he's in a boat that looks different from our boat and he's reaching down and he's pulling this line we call them trot lines y'all know what a trot line is and, and all of a sudden he I mean, that's what he would do. And that fish would go over his shoulder and he'd go into the boat. He'd pull five or six more hooks, wouldn't have anything. And then he would flip that thing. And I don't know how he did it, but that fish would come off that hook and it'd land in his boat. And then he might go 10 or 20 and he'd flip another one. And as I'm coming across that, I'm telling you, he was catching more fish than we were catching. Yes, we had four or five poles in the line, but this man had probably a thousand hooks in the water and they were all across the river. Now, tell me who's going to catch more fish, a guy with four poles and four hooks or a guy who's got a 1,000, a guy who's got a 1,000. God's got First Baptist Church Mayfield all across this region because we are a cargo ship. And the ministry that we have, no, this is not all of us individually going door to door telling somebody about Jesus, but it's us doing our ministry. And then in that ministry, whatever ministry it is, there comes a time when we get the opportunity to say why we're doing what we're doing. And we can share with somebody, the reason we're serving you is because we love you. And the reason we love you is because Jesus loved you. And we get to tell them about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. You are the ministry of the church. You're the work of the church. This word works where we get the word energy from. Ooh, do any of you remember in the 70s when we had the energy crisis? Yeah. I mean, if you watch CNN and you watch Fox News, whichever one of those y'all watch, there's always a crisis. But when they do energy crisis, if you're like me and you were raised when it got really, really bad, woo. Now I'll ask this question. Is there an energy crisis in this church? Shouldn't be. Ever ministry or to be flourishing in this church because of you. You are the energy of ministry. Amen. I mean, when something comes available, it shouldn't be on this board, but just a few days to where somebody says, hey, that's me. I'm going to fill that slot. Nope, never done it in my life. But if a pastor will tell me how to do it, I'm all in. Amen? Amen? We are the energy of this church. There should not be an energy crisis in First Baptist Church Mayfield because you are here. Now watch this. Pastors equip saints. Saints do the work of ministry. And what does the work of ministry do? The work of ministry builds up the body, edifies the body. 
Can I go back to my story about James? By the time I got to the bank, God laid upon my heart and I had this desire. I am not going to do the ministry of Hardin Baptist Church. I'm going to equip our people to do the ministry because our people are going to do ministry and God's going to bless us far more and we're going to be more of a blessing in this community if everybody is doing their part. Amen? Amen? You know what most of us Baptist churches want to do? We want to call somebody to grow the church. No. Our membership grows the church. Because we have a place where we roll up our sleeves and our britches legs and we get dirty. And you know what that ministry does? It helps grow the body. And I'm going to close with this thought. Beautiful thought, I think. This word build up in King James Version was edify, and I love that word edify. By the way, can I tell y'all, I love when the King James says verily, verily. Amen. I struggle when my ESB says truly, truly, because I like verily, verily. But this word edify, what the King James translators were trying to do is they were trying to translate a word from where we get an English word hearth from. Now, we talk fireplaces in the country. But if you were raised with money and you had one of those really nice homes, you had that hearth. That's where this word comes from. And it's that place where you take some wood, put it together, start a fire, and it, it warms the room. It warms the house. That's the word here. That's the word here. Now, I want you all to get this picture. I was raised in the country. My granddaddy Bogart didn't have a hearth, but my granddaddy Bogart had a fireplace. It was a stove that sat in the middle of the living room. There was no doors in my granny and granddaddy Bogart's home. I probably shouldn't say this, but how they had eight kids, I have no idea. (laughs) But they did. Their bedroom was the central room in the house and all the other rooms were off of their bedroom and one of the rooms off of their bedroom was the living room where the only heat source was. Y'all getting this picture? It's in the living room. My granddaddy started a fire, I believe, middle of September and that fire burned to July 22nd. My granddaddy just had a built-in thermos that when the house got below 85, he needed to put another stick of wood in the stove. And I watched my granddaddy take seasoned wood. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Seasoned wood. Now, if you're young and you don't get this, you can look it up on YouTube, okay? But he would take seasoned wood, put that wood together. He would put a little fuel on it, and he would strike a match, and, and it would burn. And then when it started to burn down, he would take a green stick of wood and put on that seasoned wood. And then he would check that fire often. And one of my favorite memories was when I would stay all night or my mom and dad would drop me off early because both my parents worked and I stayed with my grandparents a lot in the summer and the winter. I'd see my granddaddy open up that door and he'd look in there and then he'd reach for this, y'all know who I'm talking about, a poker. Long steel object. And then he would take that poker. And here's what would happen in the night. In the night, that wood would burn, but it would separate. And so in the morning when he opened that, we didn't have a blazing fire. We just had some embers. But here's what I'd see my granddad doing. I'd be over his shoulder watching because I was that kid who wanted to be like my grandparents on both sides. And all of a sudden, I'd see him take that poker. And he would poke those pieces of wood. And they'd come back together. And when he poked them back together, he would do this. He'd go, And when he blew on that, poof, there was an instant fire. And then he would shuffle around the bottom and the ashes would fall into an ash pan. And then he would get some more wood and he'd put it back on that fire. Then he'd close the door. Amen? Now, can I tell you all off the record a a beautiful picture I have of my granddaddy Bogard? My granddaddy Bogard would eat lunch by himself for some reason. I don't know why my granny would fix him just what he wanted. He would eat it. And then when he would finish eating, he would go, he would check that fire. And then after he would check that fire, he'd go over and turn NBC Days of Our Lives on. (laughs) So that fire had to be right for Days of Our Lives. Now, 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 now Now get this picture. This is the church. 
You know why ministry grows the church? Because ministry is that place where you find someone who's gifted like you and y'all come together in a ministry and you rub shoulders and you work together. And where you're working together, boom, the love of Christ is revealed and the warmth of that ministry starts to blaze. And then the next thing you know, after a few years or a few months, you decide, whoa, there's a new believer in the church who's just come to know Christ and I've been a believer for 20 years and I want them to come along beside us and we bring that new believer in alongside us and when we do, the ministry puts off the love of Christ. It's ministry that grows the church. Ministry that's done by the members of the church who are under the leadership of the pastors. You will never know the hours I spend making sure every message I preach from the pulpit of Hardin Baptist Church or I teach on Wednesday night has a practical application. So it's going to help me equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of ministry. So that the work of ministry grows the church in Hardin, Kentucky. Because we want to be a biblical church. And I want to say this. I don't want to offend anybody here. But you'll never come to Hardin Baptist Church and see a plaque on the wall that's going to tell what somebody did or how much money they gave for something. We're not going to do that. And the reason we're not going to do this is because of this passage. You know what my granddaddy believed? My granddaddy believed that every one of those sticks of wood needed to burn completely up. And I never saw him reach in there and pull a stick of wood out. You know the only way you come out if you went into granddaddy's Stove, you come out in the ash pan. And I'd see my granddaddy every morning pull that ash pan out. And then we'd walk out there and I'd walk right beside him. And I'd see him throw that ash pan in this big old pile where all of these ashes were. Now, I remember camping a lot and us starting fires. And the next morning, there'd be a little piece here and a little piece here and a little piece there. And there'd be charcoal all over those pieces. Here's what many of us want to do. And I'm so against this. Hear me say this. Retirement is an American concept. It's not a biblical concept. We do not serve the Lord for a certain period of time and then think we're done and now we get to enjoy life and watch what other people are doing. We serve Him to the day we die. We do not want, I do not want there to be a piece of Brother Ricky that's left where somebody can go, oh wow, look at Brother Ricky, here he was. He did this, this, and this. No. When my life is over and I stand before God, I want my life to be in the ash pan. I don't want there to be anything left. And when I get dumped over here, it's just me with a whole lot of others. And you do not know who I am because I didn't do what I'm doing for me. I'm doing what I'm doing for the glory of God. And I know that's your heart. And so for us to have a DNA of a biblical church, let's thank God he's given us a pastoral staff. Let's thank God and hold them accountable to equipping us, the saints, to do the work of ministry. And as we evaluate our ministry, let's make sure that our ministry is not about us, but our ministry is about others so that we can be the church that God wants us to be in Mayfield, Kentucky. Amen for his honor and for his glory. Would you say this to me one more time? The main thing thing is to keep the main thing thing. The main thing, thing. Thank you. Yes, this guy's got it. Do you have it? Father, as we get ready to sing, I don't know if you've moved on anybody's heart or not. I hope you have. Father, maybe there's a person here who is not part of the church, wants to be a part of the church. They now know what the church is. And if somebody was thinking, well, I'm going to become part of that church so it'll be all about me, they now know it's not going to be all about them when they join this church. Father, is anybody here as a church member that, wow, they've kind of got complacent? Yeah, they can talk about what they did 20 years ago and 30 years ago, but wow, they've just kind of got lax. Father, I just pray that you move in our soul, you move in our heart. And right now you prepare us to make a decision for you. Father, I think one of the pastors is going to come and stand down here. And 
I'm going to be here if there's anybody who needs counseling, if there's anybody who wants to talk, for anybody who wants us to pray for them, we'll pray for them. But Father, maybe there's just church members who want to slip down here and just pray. Pray for the church. Pray for the pastor coming. Pray for themselves. Pray for our ministry. Or maybe they just want to stand right where they're sitting and pray. Father, this is your time. It's time now for us to respond to your word. Thank you, thank you for Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. This passage works. I've seen it work in the life of a little church in a little bitty town in Hardin, Kentucky. Thank you, Father. In your son's name we pray.